Hey, I just wanted to say hello to everyone. Good evening. Glad that you're here with us. Dr. Smith is going to be running the show this evening, uh, but just wanted to uh, to welcome everybody. And uh, this is our uh, second to last mini med for the spring, and we're really glad you're here. Over to you, yeah. Dr. Smith. Thank you. Week five, we've made it thus far. Well done, us. Um, this week, we're um, right here. So, oh, yep, turning on transcription. Sorry, remind me earlier, and I'm happy to do that. Um, this week, we're going to be hearing about anesthesia. Um, and so, again, odds and ends. I know you guys already know this, but I have to say it for anybody that's just coming this week. Please make sure you change your name, um, your username to the full name that you use to register. Uh, just click on participants, hover over your name, choose more, and click rename. Most of you have already done this. Um, I'm going to leave you on mute throughout, but if at the end you have a question and you'd rather ask it out loud, please just raise your hand. Um, if you'd rather not raise your hand and, and be out loud, then pop it in the chat box, no problem at all. And everything is going to be available online um, in a couple of days. Everything's already available online that we've already done, including the questions that our speakers have answered after um, that you guys were so diligent about asking, we did get the answers, so please check that out. Um, attendance, if you've already done this tonight, great, you're done, sit back, enjoy, relax. If you haven't quite done it yet, um, the if you're attending via Zoom, please enter your full name and your school if you're still a student into the chat box. Um, if you're attending the session by phone, I'll give you the word of the day in a second. Please make sure that you email me that at ksmith at delamed.org before nine o'clock this evening. Um, keep in mind that a survey will be coming out at the end of next week that everybody has to fill out in order to get credit. Um, and then you will get your certificates after that. So our word of the day this week is blue. You don't have to put it in the chat. It's just for people on the phone. If you're doing attendance via the phone and you're going to email me, just email me the word of the day, blue, before nine o'clock tonight. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight. Our speaker is Barbara Evans. Uh, Ms. Evans is a certified registered nurse anesthetist, I practice that word, with anesthesia services. She has practiced as a CRNA at Christiana Hospital since graduating from Drexel University's nurse anesthesia program in 2009. Prior to that, she was a critical care nurse at Christiana Hospital for 20 years in the cardiovascular ICU and post anesthesia care unit. She currently specializes in cardiac anesthesia. Ms. Evans has served on the Delaware Association of Nurse Anesthetists Board of Directors for many years and is an advocate for her profession. So with that, I will stop my screen sharing and Ms. Evans, the floor and screen are yours. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Here we are. And bring this down. Here we are. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome tonight. I did not realize there were going to be more than 100 people on this, but more the merrier teaching you about anesthesia and our, uh, the great profession that I um, have been the privilege to practice in the last um, 13 years or more. So has anybody heard of uh, a nurse anesthetist before? You can just kind of nod your head. I can't really see everybody. Most, yeah, we're, it's not a, it's not something that uh, the public really is aware of. So I'm happy to share the information with you today. Um, who can say the word anesthetist? It's a hard word as, uh, as we already heard that, um, but that's how you say anesthetist. Okay, and the talk, I labeled the talk as the silent force behind the dream. And the reason calling it the silent force, one, I already told you, not many people know about our profession. So I feel that society lacks awareness and patients typically don't remember their anesthesia provider. 
probably because we give them medication so they don't remember their surgery. And also patients don't choose their provider. They choose their surgeon and then the anesthesia provider is assigned to their room. Um, but we are the force behind that drape. And that drape, as you see in the picture, right, separates the surgeon, the surgeon from the anesthesia provider. And we call that kind of jokingly, the blood brain barrier. The blood's on the one side and the brains of anesthesia are on the other. Um, but it's a joke, don't tell any surgeons that if anybody's on or is related to that. But anesthesia providers administer continuous medical care prior, during, and after surgery. And this allows the surgeon to perform surgery. And this comes with great responsibilities delivering anesthesia. We lessen the patient's anxiety. That's one of the first goals of mine when I um, take care of a patient. I want to make sure that they are coming in for their surgery surrounded by strangers, but they know that we are gonna take great care of them. We are highly trained professionals. And then the anesthesia itself, as I'm gonna go into some of that today, um, is very intense. And so it creates a lot of education and learning. Um, also the medical management during surgery, and we uphold patient safety throughout. And our another big force behind it is keeping the patient calm, letting them know we are taking care of every vital sign um, while the patient's um, having surgery. So anesthesiology. Anesthesiology is the discipline that specializes in the medical management of patients who are rendered unconscious and or insensible to painful stimuli and the stress of surgery. So if you really think about those words, the painful stimuli, I mean, you stub. 5289347. Just a second, Ms. Evans, we're, we're getting some kind of feedback here. and your vital organs during the surgery. I am sorry, that's okay. And uh, we manage pain, we manage heart and lung function, and sometimes we have to manage critically ill patients depending on where they came from, uh, the ICU, uh, et cetera. So anesthesia itself is the practice of uh, using injected inhaled medications to produce a temporary loss of sensation and or awareness. So patients do not feel their surgical procedures. It is also comprised of analgesia, which is pain control. We also reduce the movements in response to painful stimuli, and we minimize the body's response to surgical stimuli, as I already said. Anesthesia makes it possible to carry out procedures that would otherwise cause intolerable pain. So anesthesia providers, we practice clinical pharmacology, a lot of medications and um, learning about them, medical physics and physiology. So if that's something you're interested in, I see a lot of young people online here this might be something you uh, may want to look at in the future. We are also advanced airway experts. We are always dealing with the lungs and the airway and what is going on. Problem solvers, multitaskers. It's a highly complex technical environment. We're also critical thinkers, team players, which is a really big deal because we work with a lot of different people in the operating room. We have nursing, we have the surgeons, we have physician's assistants, surgical technologists. In cardiac, we also have perfusionists. So there's so many disciplines in the operating room. So you really have to be a good team player. Okay, and um, the biggest thing is we are patient-centered providers. Always, it's always about the patient. So, Many of you might have had surgery in the past and may have received anesthesia. Um, 
Well, here is how anesthesia medications are administered and how they work. It's kind of a busy slide. We're not really going to go into all that stuff, but anesthesia medications can be administered as a gas through a breathing tube that is placed after the patient's asleep, or it can be injected right into the IV, as you see right here, like that circulating blood. And where does it go? It goes all throughout the body. And uh, the medications travel throughout the body, hitting the muscles, organs, adipose tissue, which is fat. And, but specifically it has the effect on the brain to cause unconsciousness. And that's our goal. And in the brain, all this busy slide and you um, people who are still in school and taking biology and chemistry, you know, you might have heard about ion channels and the re receptors that things go through. So in the brain, the nerve signals are interrupted due to the medications acting on ion channels and receptors. And uh, when surgery is finished, we turn off the anesthetic gases. It comes out of the adipose tissue and from surrounding muscle and organs and out off the brain and we exhale it or it gets metabolized in the body and then the patients regain consciousness. Anesthesia is a beautiful thing. So history couldn't be a class without a little bit of history. I'm not gonna go into all this stuff, but dating way back in primitive times, herb mixtures were used to sedate and prevent pain during surgical procedures. Everybody has always had problems, um, but they really weren't successful. But people were determined to really find that out, um, to find something that is going to work. There's all these experiments you see in the 1500s, ether, 1600s, they were trying to put things in with a quill, with a goose quill into a dog's vein. But before the emergence of anesthesia in 1840s, surgery was synonymous with pain. Surgical, uh, surgical operations were conducted with great suffering and emotional distress. And I had read something when I was preparing for this about a woman back in 1811 described her surgery without anesthesia. She was able to take a drink of alcohol and then have her uh, her breast removed for cancer. And I'm just going to read a little bit. It's kind of gory, but I'm just going to read it anyway. She wrote in a letter to her sister, the dreadful steel was plunged into her breast, cutting through veins, arteries, flesh, and nerves, and began to scream the whole time of the incision. Her ears were ringing. It was so excru excruciating was the agony. Terrible, right? Terrible, terrible. So amen. Thank you to all the scientists and, and uh, physicians and chemists and nurses who were determined to discover anesthesia, which came about in 1846 from William Morton. He demonstrated the use of ether anesthetic for surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. And you see the audience, that's a, a painting depicting it. And this news spread throughout the world. And since then, anesthesia has been with um, all surgeries. I guess all, most surgeries, I guess, sure. Um, but now we're doing even more procedures and surgeries under anesthesia because why put the patients through that um, pain and suffering? Okay, so as you see, anesthesia and anesthesia safety continues to develop. Um, you know, back in 1905, blood pressure, that's when that was um, started to be used. Endotracheal tubes, the tubes that we use for um, breathing, and all sorts of monitoring has come about. In 1970s and 80s, that's when a drug that we use right now almost exclusively in anesthesia's propofol was uh, introduced. So it wasn't really truly that long ago. And then we also have continued um, other devices and monitoring um, that is increasing the patient safety and anesthesia safety. So now I'm going to talk about the types of anesthesia. Just this is my talk, right? So we're going to talk about anesthesia, and then I'm going to talk about my profession as a nurse anesthetist. So there are different types of anesthesia. We don't just push a button, patient goes to sleep, and then we 
reverse that and, and wake them up. I think some surgeons sometimes think that is what we do behind the drape, but that is not what we do. It's a whole big art to it. Um, but general anesthesia is the most common surgery or most common anesthetic that we use. Um, let's see, it's used in major operations such as back surgery, brain surgery, heart and lung surgery, big abdominal cases. It's usually for longer procedures. Medications are given to produce that state of reversible unconsciousness and unawareness and enable surgical procedures to take place. Breathing devices are placed, which we call intubation, and patients are connected to our anesthesia machine, which uh, assists the patient's breathing. Monitor of vital signs is uh, very important during uh, anesthesia. Our medications that we use to bring the patient in anesthesia cause great changes in vital signs. And it takes that vigilant uh, anesthesia provider to manage them with the, the highs and lows of blood pressures and um, other changes that can occur. Um, and then of course we reverse the medications as we already talked about and uh, patients wake up, they go to the uh, post-operative care, which again, we're continuing to monitor them um, until they uh, feel that they're safe to go to the floor. But as you see in the pictures, here's that tube going in and I'm gonna just bring it to the next slide too. And there's kind of gruesome picture there, but it's that opening of the trachea. That's what we find to um, place that breathing to. And then monitoring is extremely important. But the intubation part, I feel that people are always interested in finding out and in learning about. Um, this is how, how we intubate from the top. The patient is asleep, deeply asleep beforehand. We place a breathing tube in using our laryngoscope and we place, this is the endotracheal tube that goes in through your glottic opening, which is right here, which leads down to the trachea and your lungs. Right under here though, there's another opening called your esophagus. Uh, that's where your food goes when you eat. This is your epiglottis. We're always looking for that um, landmark when we go in to intubate. This will cover your vocal cords and your trachea opening when you're eating and when you're talking, um, when you're eating and drinking um, and your vocal cords were open and closed when you're breathing and when you're um, talking, right? Those are your vocal cords that make you talk. And anyway, so here's a picture of the breathing tube inside past that um, glottic opening there and into your trachea, okay? That's intubation. So another type of anesthesia is uh, monitored anesthesia care or MAC. If you've ever had a colonoscopy or a biopsy, um, this is uh, the private anesthesia that you may have received. We call it twilight sedation. There's all sorts of other um, words for it, but uh, this is more for minor procedures. And sedation ranges from minimal to deep, and it depending on what the surgery that's going to happen depends on if the patients are critically ill. Maybe we, you know, we don't want to get them too deeply asleep. Um, but this kind of anesthesia is nice because the patients they breathe on their own, so we don't have to put any airway devices in because you're not that deeply asleep. You still have your protective airway. Uh, responses. Um, and this type of anesthesia, it is normal to hear things in the background. It's, um, this is this type of anesthesia because you don't need to be deeply asleep for the type of procedure. But sometimes, and I always tell patients, you might hear us talking in the background, but most likely you'll take a really nice nap because the medications make you feel nice and relaxed and not care what the procedure is going to be. Uh, what is going to occur. So you're nice and drowsy. It's very safe. Um, we do control pain and anxiety for that, um, whatever procedures being done for the anesthesia. And some patients don't tolerate it. And we always have general anesthesia as a backup. Okay. 
Another type of anesthesia are, are spinals and epidurals. You may have heard of them before, especially epidurals with um, um, having babies. A uh, local medication, or that's the numbing medication. Like if you're at the dentist, you give um, they give that Novocaine or numbing medication. It's the same type of medication that are injected into the spinal canal to create numbness for surgical procedures. Epidurals utilize a thin catheter that's inserted in the epidural space. As you see, here's your spine. It's just a little picture, but there's a space right here that the catheter would sit in. And then nerves come through that space and the medication that we inject in there, bathe the nerves and that will numb that surrounding area wherever that catheter lies, like around the abdomen. Spinal anesthesia is a single injection with a very small needle and a concentrated um, local, again, numbing medicine. And it goes into this other space, the subarachnoid space. This is a space where your spinal cord is, but your spinal cord ends here and will go down with the spinal down here. And then that medication sits around that area and you get numb from about your right below your chest all the way down to your toes. And then it reverses uh, coming back from your toes all the way up um, within a couple of hours. But it's enough time for the surgeon to do the surgery in a in um, painless, it's a painless surgery because of the medication. Um, these are for hip surgery, knee surgeries, and as we said, already childbirth. Okay, another type of anesthesia is peripheral nerve blocks. If anybody's had knee, re um, not replacements, but um, knee surgery, shoulder surgery. I had shoulder surgery, if anybody else had had, but I received a peripheral nerve block and um, it worked great. Uh, got, I was numb for a couple days and that helped with the pain and the swelling. So uh, peripheral nerve blocks are really being utilized a whole lot more. And it has to do with this emergence of this. This is ultrasound. And by utilizing ultrasound, it has increased the safety, efficiency, and um, a lot of great improvements in our anesthesia care. What they do, they actually, um, we go in, we find the nerve with ultrasound, and we can see this is the needle going in, and we can see the needle because it's it will change colors. Well, not change colors, but it that white going in near the darkness. I guess that's a good way to put it, I don't know. But the needle going in, we can see that and we find the nerves and then inject that numbing local medicine around that nerve that hits right to the specific body part that's being operated on. So we can numb that shoulder or we can numb that knee and, um, and do so. So you have that immediate relief of pain if you've had pain in your um, extremity or wherever they're working on and then have that relief of pain. It's also great for post-operative pain because it, as I said with me, it lasted for hours after surgery. Okay. Okay, now my slide won't advance. There we go. Okay, so the anesthesia process. So what do we do for those of you who may have had surgery before, this might be a little familiar because we come in and we do the interview. We first kind of look through your, your history of what has been gathered over the, um, from your past surgical history, past medical history, and we really look at that. And that is so vital. It's vital information for us to know what medications you're on, what kind of disease you have, you know, if you have any. Um, we see a lot of young people on here. You might be nice and healthy. Be our, our, our prime candidate for anesthesia. But uh, so it's very vital to give us a full history. Have you had any family who had problems? Um, and we also do an exam. We listen to heart and lungs. We assess what labs and tests. And uh, we see if you are um, all your, like your blood sugar and your blood pressure to see if they have been optimized and make sure they're under control. 
We don't want to have surgery or start surgery if blood sugars are way high. It's very poor for um, healing process. So we look and make sure that uh, all your the disease states of patients are um, optimized as best that we can. Um, and then there's also stuff um, we have to prepare for the anesthesia. Um, we prepare our medications, we go in the room, we set up that anesthesia machine and make sure that uh, everything has been checked. This um, is our anesthesia machine that's in the operating room. This is a preparation right before a uh, heart surgery, or actually, actually the patient was in there at, during heart, um, a heart procedure. And this uh, is an anesthesia machine. It comes with a ventilator as well as um, equip, different equipment, different medications, monitoring devices, our IV poles. Um, to me, when I first had my first day of anesthesia school, I walked into that anesthesia machine and I just thought it was a monster. And, uh, but I was able to tame that monster shortly after starting anesthesia school and getting great training by my colleagues. Um, big thing is ex explanation of anesthesia and discussion of the plan with the patient and make sure that they are in, you know, in agreement, that they are signing a consent, a consent for surgery and anesthesia. And, um, you know, some people are, don't want a, a spinal or don't want the peripheral nerve block. But so that's a discussion. And so we discuss them, what are the benefits and the risks and um, make sure the patient has a great understanding of what's going to occur. Sometimes we'll give pre-anesthetic medications as needed, um, which will help the patient relax before they go into the operating room. And then we proceed with our induction, which is the start of anesthesia, intubation, maintenance and monitoring. As I talked about, that is very vital during um, surgery and then emergence, which is waking the patient up and bringing them back to consciousness and then recovering them in the post anesthesia care unit. Okay, here's a couple pictures of uh, what occurs in the operating room. Again, the anesthesia machine. Um, we have the anesthesia provider monitoring the patient during surgery. Um, the surgeons are on the other side of the drape. And here the anesthesia person is tucked way back with uh, a bunch of monitoring. As you see, um, the monitors are there. They're watching their breathing, the anesthesia machine. And that allows the surgeon to do um, whatever surgical procedure they're doing in a state of uh, unconsciousness, not moving, deeply asleep and such. Okay, what else do I want to say about this? All right, moving on. So the anesthesia environments are many. It's not just the operating room, although that's what I've kind of been saying, um, but we also work in multiple areas, labor and delivery suites, pain clinics, radiology suites, which is uh, x-ray suites, which is becoming um, more and more utilized and gastroenterology suites where they have the colonoscopies, uh, cardiology procedural suites, the electrophysiology lab, um, sometimes cardiac cath labs, um, we will assist in there. Also ambulatory surgery centers and dental clinics. Yes, we do give um, some people who uh, need anesthesia during their dental procedures. We have some anesthesia specialties, uh, critical care, cardiac anesthesia. Pain is a big one, which um, we give a lot of pain blocks outside of the hospital. Um, when you have chronic pain and sometimes people need injections at certain sites. Neuroanesthesia, brain surgery, um, back surgeries, obstetrics, having um, children, Pediatrics, of course, with our youngsters and the little tiny babies, the neonatal is um, another specialty in anesthesia. So 
there's many careers to choose from when you're thinking about going into um, anesthesia or going into medicine. Um, which one will you choose? Or some of you are retired and you already made your choices. Um, but I'm going to share with you a little bit of my journey. And then I'm going to discuss the CRNA profession. So way back in the 1980s, yes, I am older, older. Um, my journey started as a registered nurse at Christiana, at Christiana Care. And I will probably end my career at Christiana Care. I'm going on 35 years since I've been there. Uh, I worked on a busy critical care floor and then transitioned into the ICU pretty quickly. Uh, and I worked in the cardiovascular ICU with heart surgery patients. Patients were very sick and they required very intensive care. And I loved every second of it. Uh, and I think I always just love the critical thinking that's going on, the emergencies, acting calmly during emergency, get the excitement and always learning something new. And I think that is why I love anesthesia also. But this is where I learned about anesthesia and nurse anesthetists because they would bring the patients directly out from the OR to me. So I wanted to apply to anesthesia school and I didn't think I was smart enough. So I put it off, went to nurse practitioner school for a little bit, but then I started having kids and put, and put school totally off, raised my children for about the next 11 years or so. And uh, then I wanted to go back to school again, didn't think I would get into anesthesia school. So I started as a, um, certified nurse specialist it was more of the education. I was in an education role as I had changed jobs a little bit. And, uh, and then I just had that itch. I just had to go into anesthesia and do what I really, really wanted to do. And I, I got in easily. I got in, I guess easily, I'm not sure, but anyway, I did extremely well in school, loved every second of it, but it's extremely in, intense training for those three years but I'm glad I did it. I love what I do. And uh, it brings a lot of rewards um, as, as a professional. So what is a certified registered nurse anesthetist? So we, uh, a, sort of, a nurse anesthetist is an advanced practice registered nurse who specializes in anesthesia and gives anesthesia to patients in every setting in which anesthesia is delivered. We are highly trained anesthesia experts. Uh, we give safe anesthesia care and we've been around for over 150 years and we give more than 50 million anesthetics to patients each year in the United States. Many anesthesia, uh, we are the main anesthesia providers, you know, the main anesthesia providers in most rural hospitals and in the US Armed Forces. We are qualified to make independent judgments regarding and decisions uh, regarding all aspects of anesthesia care. And we have a high level of autonomy. We provide anesthesia in collaboration with many other healthcare professionals, such as dentists, podiatrists, surgeons, anesthesiologists. Uh, there are a few CRNAs, um, uh, uh, I do want to say 40% of CRNAs are actually men and uh, compared with nursing as a whole, 10% are men. Um, we have a couple different ways we can practice our, as a CRNA. Um, here at Christiana, we practice a care team model, which we work with an anesthesiologist to deliver anesthesia. The anesthesiologist oversees three to four rooms and then the nurse anesthetist See, um, sticks with the one room and sees all that patients in that room. Um, and we work collaboratively together to give the patients safe care. In other areas throughout the United States, uh, CRNAs practice independently and collaboratively with the um, surgical team or GI doctors, or um, which is gastrointestinal doctors. Um, so you can practice independently. And I have done both here in Delaware and uh, I just love all aspects of it. 
So CRNA career, it's a, a highly, it's a high job satisfaction. You could say, I, I would say most or almost all of the nurse anesthetists really just love their job. And um, it, uh, I think we just work so well together and uh, the teamwork is always on the utmost as I touched on before, but the environment is always about the team. Uh, collaboration with multiple disciplines in the hospital. We have that lifelong learning as I touched on. Um, we're always learning something new, no matter how, how smarter you will always learn something new. And uh, that's why I continue to just love what I do. Um, the career brings a lot of respect. And um, as a nurse recognized as one of the best in our field as a CRNA. Uh, most anesthesia or um, anesthesiology, you have the latest technology, and we're always, again, in trying to improve anesthesia and coming up with different things. And opportunities are all over. And we have a great income potential also. But the position does come with great responsibilities, as, as I was talking about with the monitoring and the the changes in vital signs and what can happen with the, the medications that we, we use, it comes with great responsibilities, great benefits, but high liabilities also. Schooling is very difficult and we're gonna to touch on that, um, but it is a specialized nursing care, um, a lot of critical thinking. Um, if you're interested in uh, becoming a nurse anesthetist, um, or going into nursing, really have to uh, love math, science, and pharmacology. Um, but the biggest thing is being a team player with a common goal, and that is always about the patient and the patient's well-being. We always keep our patient at the forefront. Talk about education and training of a CRNA. We have a minimum of seven to eight and a half years of education and experience to prepare for a CRNA. Uh, we first start out as a baccalaureate um, degree in nursing or a graduate degree in nursing. And then your license has to be you know, a great license, no problems with your license as a registered nurse or even an advanced practice nurse. And you have to have a minimum of at least one year full-time um, experience in an ICU as an RN. Some schools say two to three, some schools say one, um, but you do have to go into the ICU. And this is an important part because you have to have that experience and make sure that one, you got to know that dealing with critical, critically ill patients and emergencies, um, you know, that you, you like that. And, uh, and that, that would be a, a big factor when you're um, choosing your career or looking at a career. So the average experience of RNs entering nurse anesthesia educational programs is four and a half years. I came in with 20. I had a lot of good experiences. I came in, but most, most nurses, um, nurse anesthetists come in there with a, a lot less than that. So the education is a master's and doctor and or doctoral uh, doctorate prepared advanced practice nurses, nursing. Um, in 2025, all education will be at the doctorate level for CRNAs, and all the schools are changing over to that. Uh, the nurse anesthesia becomes certified by passing a national exam um, after completing the rigorous graduate degree program, and the graduates of nurse anesthesia programs have an average of um, 9,300 hours of clinical experience before they come out and practice. And there's also opportunities to specialize in uh, chronic pain and pediatrics, uh, cardiac, uh, nurse, anest nurse anesthetist schools. Um, as of September, there are 124 accredited nurse anesthesia programs in the United States and Puerto Rico. It is very competitive. Um, and for those young people who are on, we're going to go into how competitive it really is and how important doing well in school it really is. So, um, but nurse anesthesia programs are about 36 to 51 months. And as I said, all will be doctoral level by 2025. 
So your education requirements to get into anesthesia school, um, most schools want a grade point average of 3.2 or higher, and the average is a lot higher. Uh, your science GPA needs to be at least 3.0, um, but the average is higher. It's really um, very, like I said, competitive. Uh, minimum of that one year critical nursing experience. Can take, some schools will take GRE, some don't require it, um, but doing well on them. And also evaluations from former nursing school faculty and peers um, for your about, um, references. So here's just an excerpt that I saw a couple of the area schools, Drexel and uh, Jefferson. These are their requirements um, to be admitted uh, for their nurse anesthesia programs. As you see, the GPAs uh, are required. You have to have some background in statistics and nursing research and assessment. And at least one year down here is two years critical care experience and all these letters of recommendation. So when you are in your nursing program, you'll get to know your school, get to know your, your professors um, so they can write you a nice reference when you wanna further your education. And that would go for any kind of profession. Okay, so here in a career information, if you have uh, want to look at it more closely, our, um, you can visit the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology at their uh, website. And here's a picture of our nursing board. As I said, I was on the board of nursing, uh, nurse anesthetists in Delaware. And uh, we're very um, big advocates for our profession, public awareness, and, um, and patient safety. And I don't know, but one of my, I know one of my uh, colleagues is on, the, uh, is on this call with his daughter who is in, enrolled in the mini, mini medical school. So there's Tim. Hi, Tim. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave you with a couple good thoughts and things you really, as you continue on your process, you young people out there wanting to pursue something in medicine or any kind of career, but uh, hard work pays off. That is something I have, always told to my children and they still throw it back at me all the time. And as they're continuing to come out in their career, they're coming back to me and telling me, Hey, it really is paying off mom. Uh, so make good choices in life, surround yourself by good people, people who will lift you higher, not bring you down and uh, believe you can do it. If you think you can do it, go and do it. And always stay humble, be kind, work hard. And that is all I have for my talk. I don't know if I spoke, talked too fast. Oh, 742, I think that's pretty good. Good. Let me, um, I was not paying attention. So now I have to find the questions. <laughs> Hang on. What is oh, okay, so I'm in the chat box now. Oh, do I stop sharing my screen? Yes, you can stop sharing your I'll screen. Stop sharing my screen. And, and I will read out the questions for you. Is that okay. Right? okay. All right. So our first question is um, what is the difference between anesthetists and anesthesiologists? So there's anesthesiologists are go physician anesthesiologists go to medical school and then they specialize in anesthesia. Nurse anesthetists, or, and then some people are saying nurse anesthesiologists are go to nursing school and have the nursing background and then specialize in um, anesthesia. So it's the different schooling and there's a, you know, a lot of other information out there on that, um, but we still, we both are specialties and experts in anesthesia. Is there a difference between sedation and anesthesia? The sedation is, look at, we, there's different kinds of sedation. In anesthesia, we do that monitored anesthesia care, 
which is a deeper sedation. Um, if you're having a cardiac catheterization, something like that, they give moderate sedation and anesthesia usually isn't involved in that. And the RN would give that medication just a little bit. Patients aren't as deep. So that is, yes, there is a difference. And it all depends on the consciousness of the patient and the protecting of the airways. I don't want to go too much into that, but mostly how deeply asleep they are. Okay. What are some of the side effects with using anesthetic? Okay, so side effects of anesthesia, depending on what medications we use, um, start with general anesthesia. Some of the side effects are um, low blood pressure. Uh, some of the side effects are also nausea and vomiting. Um, that's why when we do your in, uh, patients interview them, we always ask, do you get motion sickness? Do you, um, how did you get sick before with anesthesia? And that's going to tell us that maybe we shouldn't use this one gas. So at least you can take charge for the afternoon group, right? Uh, wait, <laughs> no, nah, I'm just saying she'll tell you. Yeah. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. Wait, wait. Did you sorry. Me? Did you hear? Did anybody else hear that sounded like another phone call broke in? Okay, it's not just me. Fantastic. Could you maybe say that again? Because all of a sudden we got some dude saying something on on like a party line. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> just just for fun. Okay, just for fun. Okay. Um. All right. So side effects of anesthesia. That was the question, right? What are the side effects? Yes. Okay. Side effects. There's a couple of them. Nausea and vomiting. Uh, some people are more prone to it than others. Interestingly enough, females less than 50 who are non-smokers are at increased risk of nausea and vomiting after surgery. And especially if they ha having abdominal surgery or breast surgery. And this is what studies have found. All, you know, all of our things that we do in anesthesia are based on research. Uh, so yes, nausea and vomiting, we try to counteract that with different medications to help prevent it. And sometimes we'll stay away from a certain type of anesthetic. Another side effect is a uh, low blood pressure. And um, we, that's why we vigilantly monitor patients' vital signs. Um, spinal anesthesia, you can also see a lot of low blood pressures, but there's also some benefits with spinal anesthesia. It increases blood flow to the legs, like so you don't develop uh, blood clots in the legs. So there's, um, that's a good sign. Side effects, what other side effects? Um, but that's, those are the two main ones, I would say. Thing is too much anesthesia of overdosing on it? Um, I guess there is something that you would overdose in anesthesia, but but I think when people think, oh, I've had too much anesthesia, everybody reacts differently to anesthesia. People, some people will stay us, you know, just really sleepy for a long time because they don't can't metabolize it as quickly as some other people. And we truly don't always know who that is. We would have to study like your entire pharmacokinetics uh, and genes to let you really know, are you one who's gonna hold on to it? So um, I would say there, yes, there is, um, but if you stay asleep for a long time, it's, it's, side effect of our, some of the medications that stay on longer. And then, um, so I, I guess, did that answer the question? I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Um, why do some women who get an epidural have pain in the injection site later? Well, it is a, a, um, a fairly large needle used for an epidural. I said the spinal has a very thin needle, so you usually don't have too much pain. Um, but it is a fairly large needle that um, is used in it. And when we go in, sometimes we're near your, the spinal, um, your spinal process, your spinal uh, bones. 
So sometimes patients have pain after that from that. And maybe a, maybe a follow-up to that. Is there any kind of long-term effect on the body after receiving an epidural? For example, during labor, um, what are the, the effects on your body? And then do you get back pain or sensitivity at the site years later? Um, I, not that I know of or that I have read about with um, long-term effects with an epidural. Uh, do they still use the anesthesia mask? And if so, when? The anesthesia mask, yes, we use that on every general anesthesia case. We put the mask on. That mask, when we you first go to sleep, we use that to deliver oxygen. And it's really important to breathe oxygen before you go off to sleep. You're filling your lungs up with oxygen. You'll hear us, or if you, anybody had surgery, we always say take big deep breaths of the oxygen in and out, in and out. And, um, and that's filling your lungs up with oxygen. So yes, we're using the mask there. And we're also using it for when you wake up because we wanna make sure that you're breathing and you're, you're ventilating. And um, sometimes we do give anesthesia just with a mask and not put an airway device in, especially with children. Um, think of when children get ear tubes, we don't, we just use a mask. So yes, just a mask is used, but we do use a mask every time with general anesthesia. Okay. Um, does an individual CRNA do all types of anesthesia or do you specialize in one or two types? Would you be expected to perform one type of anesthesia in the morning and then do a different type or two in the afternoon? Yes, yes. So um, we would we do all types of anesthesia and just the other day, we had a, a spinal case, the first thing. The next case was a general anesthetic. And then if we need to do a peripheral nerve block on the next case, we would do that. Yes, we, we throughout a, an entire day, we don't know what's, we don't know what we're gonna be assigned to, but that day we walk in and uh, we are trained to do all types of anesthesia. Okay. Um... What is the time frame for getting anesthesia? So if you had to get it twice a week apart, is that okay? Or do you have to wait a certain period of time between them? No, if, um, if you need anesthesia more than once, um, that is okay. That is safe. A lot, we do have a lot of patients that have to have repeat surgeries. And we, I don't think, I don't know of any, um, information with long-term sequela with having, you know, anesthesia for, for so long, because our medications are metabolized through, uh, and removed, released from the body. So, um, the, the only thing I would think is that the patient came in again, they might not need as much. Um, and we always look at what they had done before, what works well, and then, um, maybe repeat it if it, if it was appropriate. Um, how do you reverse the anesthesia when you wake up a patient and what is the longest that you can keep someone under? Okay. So how do we reverse, reverse the patient? So there's a couple things that we're, when we think about reversal and anesthesia, when we turn off our anesthetic gases, as a, I kind of touched on, um, during the talk, what happens is we stop giving the medication, the anesthesia through the lungs or through the blood. And then your body, because it's an amazing thing, uh, amazing living thing, metabolizes that. And now it, that the anesthesia that was in the brain and in all the other parts of the body come off of the brain, come out of the, um, back into the blood, and then the blood will metabolize them or and we exhale them um, throughout the breathing tube. And so that's how the medications are. Those medications are reversed. We also have something that we use to relax the muscles so the surgeons can do um, their surgery. And we use a diff we use a certain kind of medication um, to remove or reverse that muscle relaxant off the receptors. And then the patient, um, patients will be able to 
you know, do all their movements as normal again. So that's how we reverse our anesthesia. Was there another question to that or did I answer it? Um, how long can you keep somebody under anesthesia? Oh, so we can keep them under as long as the surgery is needed. We, there are surgeries out there, especially like transplants, long heart transplants um, that last for hours. And sometimes you'll see, you know, I don't know, separating Siamese twins. It takes like forever. So you can have a patient under anesthesia for that long. The longer the anesthesia is on, the longer they take to wake up. And it's just the way the body works and metabolizes. What's the longest you've ever kept someone under? Hmm. Um, let's see. So I do heart surgery and we've had a good long, I guess it was 12, 14 hours just for the surgeon to be able to do what was going on um, for the heart surgery. Long day. Long day. Yes. I thought my day was long. Whew. Um, so talk to me a little bit about providing anesthesia to babies or to children. How does that differ from providing it to adults? Like what are the age, do you have certain age ranges that you'll provide certain anesthetics to or? So children are their own unique um, living being. And I love taking care of kids, but you know, they're so little. And so all of our equipment is, you know, really small, a lot smaller. Our breathing tubes are really small. The air with that laryngoscope, the one that we use to put the breathing tube in is all small. Um, and then with kids, their metabolism is so much faster. When we give anesthesia, they, we need to give them actually more. In our older patients, we give them less because they don't require as much, but the children require more anesthesia. So we always base all of our anesthetics, not on patients age, pediatrics, 20 year olds to someone who's 80, we, we alter the amount of met, um, anesthesia that we would give. And also it's based on weight too. All the medications we give is based on weight. So you have a little tiny baby. We're going to give a little tiny dose of that medication to get them off to sleep. Does that answer the question? Works for me. Okay. Um, what is the purpose of the drape between the surgeon and an anesthesiologist or anesthetist during surgery? Yeah, good question. What is the purpose of that drape? Really, we're just, we're, we don't need to, uh, I, I wonder if it really is just to decrease the stress of the surgeon not having to see what, what we're doing up there so they can just focus on the surgery. But really it is to keep everything sterile on that part because what we are, where we are in anesthesia at the head where the patient is, is the non-sterile area. So it's a sterile drape. And um, that's what it's utilized for. So everything in blue, when you see uh, the operating room, all those pictures, everything in blue is sterile. How did COVID change the way that you do your job? Whew. Now that's a loaded question. COVID whew, really hit our, um, our anesthesia profession pretty hard. And it's, it's because of that, you know, that whole unknown when COVID first, you know, first started, um, we didn't know we were, we didn't know if we were going to get COVID and die or bring it home to our family members. And they're not, it was, it made such stress in our work environment and everybody felt it. And it's because in anesthesia, we're right there at the, the, bre the breath, right? We're the ones right there in the airway. So, uh, so it really changed our practice. We we're very um, cautious on wearing our masks. And when we, when we would go, we would go to the ICU and intubate the COVID patients. You know, it was that we had to gown and, and double glove. And it, it really made us just hyper aware of uh, taking extra precautions not just with COVID patients, but we're really with everybody. And that's, um, 
since COVID now, we know so much more, and we all got vaccinated, it has, uh, we still are, you know, very cautious, but the stress just isn't there as it was um, when it first started. So I hope it, it stays down and we're not going to go into all that, but yes, it really, um, it altered our stressful environment to the utmost there for a while. Um, does anesthesia have an effect on the operation itself? Does anesthesia have effect on the operation itself? Yes. So anesthesia, um, and, and really the body's response and some people's um, uh, reactions to anesthesia can affect blood flow, can affect, it could increase blood flow or could decrease blood flow. So we, <clears throat> um, we alter our respiratory rate or our oxygen level or our blood pressure to make sure vital signs and blood flow and what they need for surgery. Cause some surgeries you need a lower blood pressure. So you don't have as much blood loss. I don't want to go into that too much, too gory. Um, but uh, say for hip surgery, you can lose a lot of blood. So we keep the blood pressure low. So yes, what we do, and if the patient has a higher blood pressure, we can increase the blood loss. So yes, we do. Um, anesthesia does affect what's going on in surgery. Um, with most medical procedures being computerized these days, what is the failure rate of the computers and machines you use? If in the middle of an operation, a machine or computer fails, what do you do? Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so our charting is on the computer. That was my first thought when I heard computerized because we doing computerized charting for about five years, but if that goes down, we just do paper charting. So if our anesthesia machine goes down, we just go to a bag mask that, um, bag mask ventilation. We have that mandatory on every anesthesia machine. And, uh, so we, if that machine went down, we would just bag you, uh, ventilate the patient. And then we would, um, give medications through the IV to keep the patient, uh, under anesthesia. So we would switch from like gas. If the anesthesia machine went down, um, ventilate and give medications through the IV. Um, if the lights go out, that's pretty bad, but, um, all the hospitals have backup generators. So that usually doesn't happen. And and uh, that's it. We would just go back to like, if the, uh, if the drug, if the um, IV, if the IV uh, pump, we used to administer medication, if they go down, then we would have to just eyeball the drips to make the right, um, right dose. So yes, we have a backup plan. We have a backup plan to keep the patient safe. And we're always ready for that. We have oxygen tanks throughout the hospital. Um, for, for those reasons, we have an extra one on every anesthesia machine for just that reason. And we have these safety devices on all of our anesthesia machines that if oxygen or the machine would stop either one, it, it um, sends off like an a really annoying alarm. So we would know immediately. I'm, I'm kind of glad to hear that. I'm not gonna yes, lie. right? Yes. <laughs> I, I like that idea. It's a great idea. Um, how about patients who, due to certain health conditions or uh, allergies, can't be given anesthesia? Uh, what alternatives do you have to use or developments can you use? Sure. We do have, um, we, you know, some patients are allergic to um, propofol. Some patients are allergic to gases. It's not really an allergy. It's, it's, it's a, uh, a genetic mutation in their body that if they have an anesthetic, we totally use something else and we stay away from that, anest um, that anesthetic gas and other medications. So, uh, and that's why that history is so vital, you know, asking any problems with anesthesia, do you have any allergies? It's always at the forefront. Um, anybody in your family ever had problems with anesthesia? And that tells us uh, if, they may have this mutation, which they're really are deathly allergic to anesthesia, but we stay away from that and we use alternative medications. There are many different types of anesthetics that we can use. 
And let's say the patient didn't know that they were allergic to it and you found out during that surgery. What would you oh, do? Yes, and thank God that has never happened to me, but it 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 can happen and it does. And uh so we have a whole protocol and that we follow for that kind of emergency. And we give the patients, and we have this whole emergency cart that we would bring into the room and we resuscitate and try to reverse the, um, the allergy or the anesthetic. Yes. Right. Uh, next question. What is the starting salary range for a nurse anesthetist? So um, it can range from, depending on what state you're working in, anywhere from, I would say, 150 to 200,000. I'm kidding. Um, okay, not sure if this is a myth or not, but is it true that redheads have issues with anesthesia? If so, how is that managed? If not, how did the rumor get started? So it, the rumor, I'm pretty sure is true because every redhead I see has a different effect to anesthesia and they usually require more anesthesia. And, um, and it, it, it is, it is funny. And I don't, I don't know if there was a research study on it, but, uh, but yes, it is a notorious thing that redheads typically will have a different reaction to anesthesia. How do we manage it? We give more, we monitor even more carefully, but we, we just anticipate something um, that uh, the patient may need something more or uh, something different if they're not metabolizing or if they're metabolizing it too fast, then maybe we would use something else in addition um, to keep them under the anesthesia. But yes, it is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's always talked about. What, um, if any, different training do you need to do dental anesthetic? Um, not really any uh, further training. I have I've done the dental um, anesthesia, and uh, it really is just getting to to uh, actually getting to the dental facility. And uh, really teaching the dental assistants and the dental um, technologists there um, about the airway them itself and to make sure that when they are working in the airway, they're keeping it very clean and or very dry. And uh, but there really is no extra um, training for dental anesthesia. Um. Some elderly people end up with dementia after general anesthesia. Do they recommend spinals or twilight sedation for elderly people to prevent the result of dementia? Okay, that's a good question. And we call that um, uh, uh, post-operative delirium. Maybe I get, there's another word for it too. Um, but yes, we do have elderly patients that uh, can develop this post-operative um, dementia, delirium. And um, what we what we are finding out, um, and this is always being studied, and we're really, you know, we're trying to find what is best care for patients. And um, we, there has been one drug study that if you add this on, it decreases the chance of delirium. So that's one thing we like to do. Uh, and if they, if they're a candidate for a spinal, then yes, it would be, but not spinals aren't always used for different kinds of surgery, especially if they're having like a shoulder surgery or, or something else. Uh, and, or twilight. Yes, we, we would love to be able to do twilight anesthesia on our elderly population with that, with that history or that risk. But, um, you know, if they're having a big procedure, the, you can't use twilight, you have to have general anesthesia. So to prevent it, like I said, we um, try not to give uh, certain medications that may alter their um, thought process. And um, we add a different medication that help can has been found to decrease um, the ris uh, risk of dementia. But yeah, the confusion sometimes afterwards, it's, uh, 
it sometimes it just takes them, them a while to wake up and then other times it, it lasts for a couple days. Have you ever had any cases where the anesthesia has worn off on a patient during a procedure? What would the response be? So I personally have not had that happen, um, but the, res the response would be, we would see it with the vital signs. And that's why we're, we monitor vital signs. Your heart rate would go up, the blood pressure would go up, um, you know, they, they would move and uh, that would be their response. Um, that has not happened to me. Um, but what we're doing as we're monitoring, we're watching those vital signs. And as soon as you see like a little blip in the blood pressure, not saying that they're waking up, but maybe they got, uh, they're on the lighter side from the painful stimuli of what the surgeon is doing. So we would increase our anesthetic. We are constantly increasing, decreasing our anesthesia as needed and uh, giving different medications um, to help with the changes that are going on. I'm also glad you said that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It, 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 I, I know there was a lot of, I think there was a movie out, the awareness under anesthesia. I don't know the percentage of that happening, but um, we use uh, different we use different techniques or monitoring to know no. what our patients are and what um, patients, how deeply they are asleep. And um, we use the, I'm just gonna say end title uh, agent of the anesthesia of, I don't know how to say this without like being too confusing. But anyway, so we look at that and it has to be a certain number to know that all the studies say that if you're at this 0.7, of that anesthetic coming out of the lungs, then you there is decreased chance of awareness. Now, when we use IV anesthesia, we put on um, a BIS monitor. I forget what BIS stands for, but it's uh, looking at the brain waves and and it's um, it was discovered a few years ago. We were using it a lot, and then they found it wasn't as really great useful as they thought it was. But and then those numbers tell us how deeply they're um, a, for the most part, deeply asleep. And what are their chance of being aware under anesthesia? So when those numbers start to go up, we would increase our anesthesia uh, just to keep them between that 40 and 60 number. So um, yes, it doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen. doesn't happen at, um, very often, but those are the things we, we uh, look at as well as our vital signs and heart rate um, to make sure that the patient is deep enough for the surgery. Are there any pros and cons to being a nurse anesthetist versus an anesthesiologist? Pros and cons. Well, let's see. So I love my job and I love being a nurse and I was a nurse first, and that's how I chose that path. Um, I think the pros is that uh, I didn't have to go pay all those medical school bills and uh, all the years that they've had, they had a lot of, you know, years, but, but their knowledge, their pro is they, they learned a lot about a, a lot of other different things too. And um, so they, they can bring that into practice. Um, what else is the pro? Uh, we have a great collab. Um, we have a great team of, as being a nurse anesthetist. And I think that's what I love about it. We're very supportive of each other and uh, it, we don't like, we can go and there's no judgment, passing judgment. We can say, Hey, I did this case the other day and, you know, I'm doing this case tomorrow. What do you think? What do you use? And, and we just really feed off each other and we're always learning. Uh, yeah. Some of that, the pros and cons and the con there's, you know, always some controversy regarding, you know, an anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists and, but really we work together as a team and all that goes aside to take care of the patient. Glad to hear it. 
what advice would you give to someone that faces the fork in the road on whether to educate themselves with the CRNA program or an NP program? Hmm. So when you're looking at that, you want to know what, what drives you, what motivates you, what did you like in your nursing um, career? Did you love critical care? Is that your, you know, you know, you might want to, if you really loved critical care and all that emergencies and critical thinking and, uh, and surgical patients, you know, nurse, uh, nurse anesthetist might be for you. If you're, um, nurse practitioners and you like maybe, I mean, there's, there's so many avenues as a nurse practitioner and, uh, it just, I think if you have like a specific interest in like, I know a nurse practitioner who is just loved neurosurgery and that was her passion. Another one loved trauma. So she became a nurse practitioner and the trauma program or in the neuro um, program. So it's, it's really what drives you, what is going to keep your interest in that, um, and that love. And, and uh, you know, the best way to do it when you're at that fork go and shadow a CRNA, go and shadow a nurse practitioner and, and find out really what they do. And then that will really help you make your decision too. And we have, um, uh, Christiana care. We have a shadowing program. I'm not sure with COVID, maybe with COVID lightening up. Um, we, ha- we're going to restart that. So shadow would be uh, a, a good way to uh, figure that out. Um, is there a difference between a saddle block and an epidural? And do they still use a saddle block? If there is a- um, they do use a saddle block. I am not that familiar with it. And I know, I think they use, use that in the pediatric population more. Um, and that is like a, a lower, a, a lower um, area in the spine to use a saddle block compared to the epidural. So I don't have a good answer for that. Um, Okay, that's fine. Is laughing gas considered anesthesia? Yes, yes, it's called nitrous oxide. And a lot of dental offices use that um, as part of their treatment or anesthesia for um, the dental office. And um, uh, some uh, some places still use nitrous oxide. We don't always use it at Christiana. We kind of did away with it for a little while, but uh, um, it is still used. Yes, laughing gas is an anesthetic. When do you make the decision to put in a breathing tube versus not putting it? Okay, that's a great question. So it depends on the surgery, what type of surgery they're having. Um, And and we also discuss it with the surgeon, right? What what do they need? Do they need the patient to have that muscle relaxant as we talked about? And if so, then we definitely put a breathing tube in. And then if not, we could put in a different airway device and LMA. Um, But it all depends on the patient's health. and disease process and uh, the type of surgery that the patient's going to have. Okay. Um, how about loss of hair from anesthesia for like a knee surgery or something like that? You know, I've never, that? I've never heard of that. Okay. Loss of hair? Loss of hair. No. What they say. Mm-hmm. Okay. I do not know anything about that. Um, are there any anesthesia medications that are not pharmaceuticals or like quote unquote natural? What is that? Are there any anesthesia? Um, I guess they wouldn't be medications, but is there any natural anesthetic? Any natural anesthetic? Non pharmaceutical anesthetics. Not that I know of. No, I, I, uh, no, mm -mm, I don't think so. Tim, do you know of any, I don't know if he's listening, but, um, natural anesthetics. 
I mean, you have your analges analgesics of morphine, which is from opium, opium plants. Um, but okay. that I don't. Okay. Um, what preventative measures are taken with patients that might be taking medication that will interact with their anesthesia? Do you have to stop the medication and wait? What's, what's the plan there? So, yeah, we have like one, one medication of blood pressure medicine that is notorious to decrease the blood pressure um, after anesthesia. And so we need to be aware of that one and two, then we um, have different medications that we would use to counteract that. Um, a lot of times patients are on blood thinners too. So that's another avenue, not necessarily for anesthesia, but it actually, it is for anesthesia because then we wouldn't put in a spinal or an epidural or anything in the spine if they were on a blood thinner. Um, but that would be also something for surgery if they didn't stop their blood thinner. Then um, depending on what surgery they did, they may have to delay that. Um, other medications, you know, like I said, with the insulin, if you're not taking your insulin or your blood sugars are out of control, not necessarily an anesthesia, but you're really going to have decreased healing. So it's really important to keep your diabetes under control. Um, that's, that's pretty much what I can think of, unless there's something specific someone wanted to know about. Nurse Evans, I, I have a little bit of an additional answer to your question. I I consulted one of the apothecary uh, resources. Um, so clove oil is a natural topical anesthetic. Oh. Opium poppy, of, of course, that's the active ingredients is, is morphine. Uh, and then creams with capsaicin can be a topical anesthetic. So there are at least three naturals out there with one of them of course, being the basis for the opioid crisis. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. How mm -hmm. low does a person's vital signs get during procedures when they're under anesthesia? Well, it depends, um, they could get pretty low. They could get pretty low. So um, it depends on the medication, the reaction to the medication. Uh, how sick they are before um, coming into surgery, uh, their heart disease. Um, patients come in and they know they're already in some kind of heart failure. Sometimes their blood pressures can go low. And we see that a lot in cardiac anesthesia, but we have medications to help bring up the blood pressure or help. Sometimes we just give it right at the bat and, and to try to prevent it, or we start medication drips to keep the blood pressure up constantly. Um, during the surgery, what verbal communication exists between you and the surgeon? Oh, it's a constant, well, not constant, but the verbal communication, it's, it's an open communication. Um, we use closed loop communication, which is a part of a, a way to keep patients safe. And that is when he re requests something like, can you, I don't know, put the bed up. We always like repeat it back bed up. Um, can you give the heparin given heparin? He'll say, um, you know, we'll say the dose heparin's in it's, uh, so we're always repeating back. Um, but there, there is a lot of communication depending on, um, what surgery is being done and how much communication is needed. We are the bed controllers during, during most operations. So they do have to ask us a lot to do things. Um, and so we're always repeating things back. And then if there, if things are, you know, if we have discussions about the patient's blood sugars, we'll let them know if the patient's blood pressure was low when we started them on that blood pressure drip, we'll let them know. And that is just to keep them informed of what's going on, again, to keep them calm and, you know, not excite them, but to let them know, you know, just what, what's going on at the anesthesia area. Um, what is the risk to the anesthesiology team over time in exposure to the active agents used to sedate patients? Wow, what great questions. Yes, um, I don't know the answer, but we, uh, <laughs> we, we don't, so the anesthetic, anesthetic gases that the patients receive, you know, 
constant. We have a, uh, what's a scavenger on our anesthesia machine, which suctions out when the patients breathe it out. So it goes out actually into the environment, but uh, so that's protecting the, us as well as the people in the operating room. Um, we don't wear any kind of monitoring devices for the anesthetic agents that we may, you know, get secondhand. But um, it's usually, we're usually very careful and, you know, turning it off, turning it on if we're disconnecting the um, endotracheal tube or the, the, from the ventilator. What kind of monitoring is needed when anesthesia is used during a colonoscopy in a non-hospital setting? Yes. Did you say monitoring? I don't, I'm not seeing the question, but is that, what was the question? What kind of monitoring is needed when anesthesia is needed during a colonoscopy in a non-hospital setting? Okay. Yeah, so it would be the same that we do in a hospital setting. We have standards of care in anesthesia that you have to follow in all settings. So you would have your heart rate and rhythm on there, your EKG, your heart rate and rhythm, your blood pressure, and your pulse ox continuously monitored. And then we also monitor and um and title carbon dioxide, which is what you breathe out. So we know every breath that you're taking. Uh, so yes, that is standards of care in any anesthesia environment. Do CRNAs have to be on call? Do they work different shifts to cover for emergencies? Does it depend on where you work? Yep, it depends on where you work. Uh, yes, we do call at Christiana and uh, we do have some pretty long shifts. And it all depends on if you're in a hospital that does call. So you could, yeah, you could do call if you want to. I choose to do just beeper call from home, um, which is part of the cardiac team. Uh, but other people do in-house call. And that is that we always have two teams, two anesthesia teams available for any emergencies or cases that need to be done throughout the night. Those long surgeries. Do you get a break? Oh uh, yes, we're uh, we're you know to keep the vigilance. Um, we are constant. We're not constantly, but we do give breaks as much as we can to our colleagues. And a lot of times we have people who are who don't have anything in their room, and then they'll go and make sure that everybody well tries to. It's not doesn't always happen. Depend on how busy we are, but to make sure that we get breaks and. Um, in Christianity, we work with the anesthesiologist, so sometimes they will give us the break if they are able to. So yes, breaks are very important with those long surgeries. And that helps that refreshing break. You come back in and you're ready to, you know, to be that vigilant provider again. So it's always good. Is there any time when you might be giving one type of anesthesia and then you realize the patient is going downhill or something and needs to be intubated? Of course. Yes. So what point is that decision made, I guess? So, you know, when we're doing sedation or that monitored anesthesia care, we always have general anesthesia as backup. So next to the anesthesia machine, I didn't show you, but we have this anesthesia cart that's full with all of our anesthesia equipment and medications. And so at any time, we always have a, um, our airway equipment readily available. So we're monitoring, like I said, we're doing the monitors. We're looking at the oxygenation level. We're looking at the breathing, that end tidal CO carbon dioxide. So when we see things start to go awry, one, we can ventilate for them just with that mask that someone asked about. And then we have this whole technique where we, how we hold the mask and how we fold the jaw up and we can ventilate for them. And if they really need to have that breathing tube in, we could put it in right then and there. But yes, it's it's recognizing um, the need depending on the vital signs and what's going on with the patient. So yes. All right, well, this was great. We are fresh out of questions, which is the first time that this has happened so far that we actually managed to get through the questions. So well done. Wow, um, lots of questions. They were great. That was fun. They were fantastic questions. Um, thank you for coming, everybody. Next week, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Paul about childhood um, development. And next week will be the last week. So have a good week. And we will see you on the last day of March. <laughs>